Subthreshold conduction is the primary leakage mechanism in most MOSFETs. Subthreshold conduction is perhaps the most important and most dominant form of uh, leakage in a traditional MOSFET. In fact, combined with a certain um, quote-unquote secondary effect called brain-induced barrier lowering, and also combined with um, contradictory requirements uh, to gate tunneling, subthreshold conduction at some point in time seemed like it would be the ultimate limit of transistor scaling. So we have to understand how subthreshold conduction happens, and we have to develop a model for uh, the subthreshold current before we start to look at how um, significantly more complicated the situation becomes when we consider the impact of the drain. So subthreshold conduction is conduction that happens in a cutoff transistor simply because we have a deficient the definition of the threshold voltage. So if you go back to any devices, uh, class or to module one uh, of these video modules, you will find that the definition of the threshold voltage uh, was based on band bending in uh, the channel, in the body of the MOSFET. So the P-type body of the MOSFET, because it's P-type, has a Fermi level, which is uh, above the middle of the band gap and so uh, which is actually below the middle of the band gap and so the fermi level is around here and this distance between the uh, middle of the band gap the intrinsic fermi level and the actual fermi level is uh, related to the concentration of holes in the substrate and is thus related to the concentration uh, to the doping we use in the substrate so Let's assume that this is the surface of the oxide. We defined the uh, threshold voltage uh, as the point, at, as the voltage at which bending in the bands of the substrate is so much that the surface of the substrate is as n-type as the body is p-type. So when you apply positive potential to the gate, some of this potential falls upon the, uh, the oxide and some of it falls upon the surface of the body. Uh, so the part that falls upon the surface of the body causes bending in the valence band, in the conduction band, and in the intrinsic Fermi level, but not in the Fermi level. And so um, you see here that the Fermi level here is above the intrinsic Fermi level, which means that the surface has now become n-type. Not only so, it is above the Fermi level by as much as it was below the Fermi level uh, before the bending. Or in other words, it is as far above the Fermi level as it is below the Fermi level deep in the body. If you go deeper in the body, this distance which is, uh, let's just call it uh, delta E, is equal to this distance. And this means that the concentration of electrons at the surface of the uh, substrate is now as high as the concentration of holes in uh, deep in the body. So then we consider the fact that there is a channel and then, then we can um, derive the drift current that flows, flows through this channel and so on. But when we developed models for uh, conduction in a MOSFET, we assumed that if VGS was below V threshold, there was no channel, and therefore IDS was equal to zero. Because between the drain and the source, we basically see two reverse biased PN junctions, and um, they develop depletion zones that do not touch, and therefore there can be no conduction between them. And this is not true. According to this image, this is not true, because below threshold voltage, there is still a channel. Because what happens below threshold voltage is that um, there is still bending, but the amount of bending is something along these lines. And so, yes, the Fermi level is still below the intrinsic Fermi, is still above the intrinsic Fermi level, indicating that there is a channel between the drain and the source. That channel is not as rich in electrons as the channel that you would see uh, above V threshold, but it is still a channel. And, and so there is actually a uh, kind of uh, diffuse or light channel. Maybe it's not even that light. It's a, it's a channel that exists below V threshold. And so there is a discrepancy between uh, 
how we define the threshold voltage and then how we use it. So we define the threshold voltage as the voltage at which the channel is as n-type as the body is. And then we forgot the fact that below the threshold voltage, there is an n-type channel. It's just not as intensely n as the deep bulk is intensely p. Uh, and then we said, okay, there's no channel below the threshold voltage and therefore there's no current. That's not true. There is a channel. It's a weak channel, yeah, but it's a channel and therefore there will be current. And if you have a situation such as this, where uh, the gate potential is zero volt and the source is at ground, but there is a potential at the drain, then current will flow through this weak channel. This is subthreshold conduction. In other words, if you use the, uh, let's assume that the transistor is saturated and you use the pinch off saturation model for current, um, or even velocity saturated model, both of them will uh, uh, conclude or give you uh, a conclusion that below V threshold, the current is zero. And specifically at V threshold, the current is zero. What we are saying here is that actually at V threshold, the current is not zero. IDS is not zero at V threshold. And below V threshold, the current is not zero either. So the current at V threshold is a specific value of current called I threshold. This is assuming, of course, the transistor is saturated. So there is a saturation current flowing, I threshold. It should be a small value, but it is non-zero, and that is significant. And then, yeah, this drops as VGS drops. But what happens at VGS equals zero? There is still some kind of conduction happening here, and this is the I off that we are concerned about. So when you... Uh, when you apply a gate potential of zero volt, you assume that your transistor is completely off and that the current is null, but the current is not null. It's this I off. And so we are concerned about this. We want to find out what's the value of I off. And we will find that I threshold, the current that flows at the threshold voltage, is pretty much controlled by technology. But what we really care about is how fast the current drops below threshold voltage. Because if we have a situation like this, or we have a situation like the curve I drew originally, or a situation like this, these are three different scenarios with three very different results. So the last curve I drew, this one, is excellent because we have a very small off current. Whereas this curve is kind of uh, disastrous because we have a large off current. So, we will find that what really matters is the slope of the current as it drops below the threshold voltage. And so um, in the next video, we'll develop a, a model for uh, how much subthreshold current there is, like how to uh, write an equation for subthreshold current and start to understand um, why it increases the way it increases, why it decreases the way it decreases. But to do that, we have to distinguish between two things, uh, weak inversion and strong inversion. And these are two concepts from, uh, from devices that we have to uh, go back and, and take a quick look at. So in strong inversion, um, if, you, uh, if you recall, strong inversion means that basically VGS is above V threshold. And what happens in strong inversion is that the bending at the surface of the uh, oxide saturates. There's no more bending at the surface of the oxide. We can't, uh, we can't bend it any further, right? And so if you apply any more gate potential, what happens is that any extra, any excess gate potential, let's assume that this is the original situation, and you apply more gate potential, all of the excess gate potential will go to the oxide, and so the oxide will bend further, whereas the substrate will not bend. And if you go back and look at the expression of Q inversion, the amount of inversion charge in the channel, this is the reason we had Q inversion equal to C oxide times VGS minus V threshold. So basically, it starts to act like a capacitor because all of the excess voltage goes to the insulator, participating in coupling more charge to the bottom plate. That's all that's happening here. The, the substrate starts to behave 
as if it is a, uh, a conductor. And so we start to see something similar to a metal insulator metal behavior, uh, with the exception that we have a, a, an offset of V threshold. Below V threshold, we have a, a regime called weak inversion. In weak inversion, any excess potential will actually be divided between both the oxide and the semiconductor. And so we start to see uh, if you apply any excess delta VGS, it goes to both the semiconductor delta VS and to the oxide delta V oxide. And they both bend and they share the amount of bending between them in a significantly non-trivial way. But all we have to know here is that there will be further bending the more VGS you apply. There will be further bending to the substrate, which will have a, a huge impact on the shape of the current, the equation of the current, and, and how it looks.